Um, thank you for joining us today for the Public Housing Authority Disaster Readiness Response and Recovery Webinar Series. Um, and today we'll be talking about extreme temperatures, both summer heat and winter storms. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Um, all participants are muted um, and we're just at, uh, asking to hold questions until the very end. Although if you have questions throughout, go ahead and post them in the questions and answers section. Um, and then we'll just answer all questions at the end. I'm pleased to introduce Brenda Johnson Turner, Associate Deputy Assistant Direct Secretary for Field Operations in Public and Indian Housing at HUD. The field operations staff are pivotal in advocating for public housing authorities before and when disasters strike. This training series is a continued example of our work and partnerships. Ms. Johnson Turner, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Good afternoon and thanks to all for joining this first webinar in the HUD PIH, PHA Disaster Readiness Response and Recovery Webinar Series. This webinar series directly aligns with HUD and the White House priorities to equitably improve the nation's disaster recovery and building long-term inclusive resilience to the impacts of climate change, particularly for historically marginalized communities. Given some of the recent natural disasters and feedback from PHAs around the country, we launched this webinar series as a resource to help prepare PHAs prior to potential events so that an equitable, inclusive recovery is possible. Today, we will be talking specifically about extreme temperatures, but in the coming weeks and months, we will also discuss wildfires, tornadoes, flooding, and building fires. Our goal with the webinar series is to ensure your PHA is ready to respond to and recover from any disaster that may impact your family and property. Knowing the federal, state, local, and nonprofit resources prior to an event is a fundamental step in being ready. This webinar should help to build or grow on the foundation of knowledge in the resources available and in disaster readiness, response, and recovery. Thanks again to all of you for joining. We look forward to your participation in this webinar and the future webinars in this series. Thank you so much. Um, as was mentioned, we do have um, a series of webinars. Today's is the second in the series and um, the following dates you can see on your screen. All webinars and registration information is in um, the HUD exchange. And as I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and so it will be available on the HUD exchange as well in the coming days. We also wanted to let you know that um, the current PHA Disaster Readiness and Preparation Guide that was published in 2016 is currently being updated. Um, the new guide uh, entitled PHA Disaster Readiness, Response and Recovery Guide 2022 um, will include new sections on roles and responsibilities, communications, short and long-term housing options, recovery timelines, funding strategies, and financial management. And we expect this to be released in the coming months. Along with this guide will be a series of fact sheets, and all of these will be available on a single page on the HUD exchange. So today's full agenda 
um, includes a quick overview of extreme temperatures, both extreme heat and winter storms. And then we'll talk about recommended best practices in disaster readiness, response, and recovery. Finally, we have a few case studies um, that we will learn about how these elements played out in real life uh, scenarios. So we do have a lot of information to cover today and we're excited to share with you. Um, so presenters for today's webinar include Brittany Kelly, who has been a leader in disaster recovery with the state of uh, South Carolina's Emergency Management Division. Uh, Brittany is now with Cone Resnick and supports multiple state and federal grant recipients in disaster recovery and grant management. Fred Tombar is a nationally recognized expert in housing and disaster recovery who has been appointed to advise presidents, HUD and Homeland Security secretaries and governors over his 25 year career. And I'm Jody Spear. I'm an affordable housing consultant with over 20 years in housing authority management, policy and research. So as I mentioned today, we're going to be talking about best practices in each of the areas of disaster management related to extreme temperatures. Um, these best practices come from you know, every other experiences, disaster management um, guides, and these are best practices and not HUD mandates unless otherwise indicated. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about extreme heat. So extreme heat is measured by a heat index, meaning um, a combination of what the temperature feels like and humidity level. Um, during an extreme heat event, temperatures might not cool down at night um, and with no reprieve from the heat, it becomes more difficult for our bodies to cool down. Uh, the National Weather Service typically issues heat advisories if the temperature is expected to be above 100 degrees for at least two days. But this number can vary across the country in areas where high heat um, happens on a regular basis and communities are more um, equipped to respond to that, the, that number might be different. Staff and residents might be at risk of heat-related illnesses. Um, and extreme heat is responsible for the highest number of annual deaths among all weather-related hazards. So a few things we see in extreme heat, um, there's definitely an increased demand for air conditioning and this can strain the power supply. Additionally, water resources are strained as we see demand increase. The high humidity combined with the high temperature increases the risk of thunderstorms. And as vegetation dries out, there is an increased risk of brush fires and wildfires. Also, high heat can deteriorate and buckle the pavement. We'll also be talking about winter storms. Um, winter weather warnings, watches, and advisories are issued by the local National Weather Service offices and is based on local criteria. Again, communities across the country are differently prepared for responding. So blizzard warnings, um, they're issued for high wind gusts, uh, falling and blowing snow, impacting visibility and uh, making travel difficult. Ice storm warnings are issued um, when ice accumulation of one fourth of an inch or more is expected. The wind chill warnings alert public about the potential of very cold air and wind. And uh, lake effect snow warnings are issued when lake-induced snow is expected to produce uh, significant snowfall accumulations. 
So some things that we see uh, related to winter storms, um, the severe winter weather can cause property damage, including roof damages um, from heavy snow, ice and sleet, uh, water damage from burst pipes, and also water damage caused from ice dams, which happen when water doesn't flow properly through the gutters and then it seeps into the building because it doesn't have anywhere else to go. Uh, severe winter weather though can also cause risks to health and safety, um, slips and falls, car accidents, um, carbon monoxide poisoning, hypothermia, and then in inability to access food, healthcare, and medicine. And we're going to talk about those. We have a couple of polling questions. Um, uh, yeah, so we have a couple of po polling questions we're going to pull up for you. And so we are interested in hearing about your, uh, who our audience is. So if you would take a minute and answer um, just two questions for us. At your current PHA, have you encountered a severe weather emergency? And second, have you developed a plan for preparing or responding to a severe weather event? Okay. And here we see uh, the respondents. So um, just over half of you have encountered a severe weather event. And so happy to have you here with us. Um, have you developed a plan? And so about a third in each category. So yes, you do have a plan. Uh, no, you don't. And, and about a third of us aren't sure. So. Thank you for responding to that. Um, and now we are going to move into the readiness um, section of our webinar. Great. And I'll turn it over to Fred. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. How uh, you all prepare for a, an extreme weather event will affect how well you respond to and recover from that event. And uh, certain things that you can do critically to um, uh, prepare for an event. One is to identify uh, those actual and potential needs that you have by conducting a risk ass assessment. Uh, you can develop partnerships in your local community. You can plan and organize your resources and systems and uh, undertake recovery planning activities uh, and uh, prepare uh, to, to get ready uh, and to respond to a, any uh, extreme weather event. And then finally, uh, conduct education and training with both your, your staff and your residents. And so we'll talk about each of these in more detail. And conducting a risk assessment, uh, want to take into account those people who your housing authority has who are most um, at risk. That would be older adults and uh, children, pregnant women, uh, folks with a certain medical condition, uh, and in particular people uh, in the heat event with uh, respiratory issues or who have obesity related uh, conditions. They will be uh, at greater at greater risk when there's extreme heat and and uh, weather winter weather, uh, your your staff who work outside also um, those people who take a shower after work rather than before work um, or ones that you really want to uh, be concerned about uh, and and uh, identify the risk associated with the jobs that they do uh, when weather event uh, events happen. Particularly uh, for heat events, you want to identify if your housing authority works 
in an urban heat island, uh, basically an urban uh, city or metropolitan area where there are, because of human activity, it, ten it tends to be hotter than the areas that surround it. Um, and uh, the heat uh, activity certainly is, is greater sometimes even at night than in the daytime. Uh, you want to take into account where there is a lack of air conditioning or access to cooling to cool spaces. And uh, because of the potential impact of, of fires um, from uh, when there's heat events, uh, look out for places where you have dry vegetation and power outages are both a concern in heat events and in winter events. And winter events, um, you want to particularly look out for uh, places where uh, there's a lack of access to, to heat and warm spaces. Next slide, please. So developing partners is important. Uh, again, your housing authority won't be alone in having to deal with the impacts of an extreme weather event. And so there'll be others in your community who you can call on uh, when, in fact, there is an event. Uh, uh, coordinating in advance with these organizations, uh, nonprofit organizations, other um, uh, organizations that serve the communities that uh, the people in your community who you've identified are most at risk. So uh, Council on Aging or, or other um, aging uh, uh, elderly nonprofits. Uh, and most importantly, coordinating with your local emergency management uh, office and uh, your local government uh, is, is critically important. It also, in, in terms of partnership and uh, development and coordination, you want to collaborate, uh, as I said, with the local office of, of emergency management, your health department, um, because they can uh, uh, provide access to community heating or cooling centers. And we'll hear more about um, that type of coordination in, in some of our case studies that will follow later. Uh, your PHA uh, may want to create heating and cooling centers in your PHA properties. Uh, there may be sp uh, space that would be available and accessible to your seniors and others who are high risk uh, and uh, your partners can help you with, with the development of those spaces. Uh, PHAs can also identify other places where residents could go to get some relief, uh, especially when uh, you're, you're having extreme temperatures. So libraries and shopping malls um, uh, and uh, other community facilities uh, can be used as heating or cooling centers. It is important that you develop resources for uh, and identify the resources that would be available for your residents. Um, so planning ahead, you want to consider um, uh, those types of resources that would be necessary when you respond to an event. Uh, in particular, uh, transportation uh, for access, providing access to uh, community warming and cooling centers. Uh, people who may be available to help you with conducting wellness checks, especially um, in, uh, in, uh, with your local health uh, department. Um, you want to train your staff on uh, heat-related illnesses and signs of hypothermia, how to recognize those uh, in your residents. And then um, finally, you want to provide your residents with information on local resources. Certainly the, the low, in, um, low income housing, I mean, uh, low income, uh, well, I, I'm forgetting what it stands for, I'm sorry. Um, energy assistance program, housing energy assistance program, um, and local utilities sometimes and, and local state and local governments will also provide assistance to help with the increased energy costs that uh, are represented uh, that uh, often uh, show up when there are extreme health events. I mean, heat, heat and, wet and cold events. For your, your staff, uh, you wanna work 
to train your staff to recognize and respond to the signs of heat and cold weather illnesses, hypothermia, heat stroke, uh, things that uh, folks may uh, experience in, in those uh, events. Uh, your systems, you wanna make sure you develop policies for um, uh, communicating uh, with staff and residents and uh, even with your housing choice voucher participants and, and landlords. Um, if feasible, consider purchasing items uh, such as generators uh, that you can use when there are power outages, uh, air conditioning units, portable or window air conditioning units that can be uh, placed in the units of, of those people who are most vulnerable. Uh, make sure if you do have generators that you have fuel uh, to operate those or a contract um, with someone to, to provide fuel to operate those. And Brittany will talk a little bit more about this later. Um, and certainly if the, uh, if the electricity goes out, uh, you, need to, you need flashlights. Uh, some things uh, for your facilities in terms of extreme heat that you want to uh, consider in terms of resource guidance and development is maintaining a supply of uh, window air conditioners and or fans. Um, you want to expect the window uh, openings for, for, for safety. Um, sometimes uh, when we, when uh, housing authorities paint, uh, they may paint a window shut uh, and uh, you wanna make sure that folks have access to be able to open the windows uh, so that they can get airflow in the heat event. Uh, uh, be aware of the location of local cooling centers so you can provide that information to your residents and uh, keep sufficient water on hand. It is critically important that people stay hydrated in a heating, uh, uh, an extreme heat event. When uh, it comes to winter weather events, extreme winter weather events, uh, you wanna regularly inspect for snow and ice, uh, uh, regularly inspect your snow and ice removal equipment to make sure that you can maintain the safety of uh, your walkways uh, to and from your uh, facilities. Maintain a supply of, of space heaters that are approved for indoor use. This is, uh, and uh, uh, with that, you're going to need smoke and carbon monoxide um, alarms to, and to make sure those that you has, have are fully functional. Um, inspect your fire extinguishers to make sure because if people are overloading the circuits, hopefully uh, they aren't, but it can cause um, accidental fires and you want people to, to to uh, be able to put those fires out as quickly as possible if necessary. Um, and be aware of the location of any warming centers that the uh, community has, um, if possible. And uh, we'll talk about uh, it when in mitigation section um, about some resources that might be available to help you with this. Uh, procure mobile uh, boilers for your facilities. Now, uh, getting your organization and uh, staff ready for an event and being able to uh, maintain operations is critically important in any type of uh, disaster event. Um, but in extreme weather, uh, it certainly is it's also applicable. Uh, uh, so making sure that you have a continuity of operations plan for your organization that describes all the policies uh, that uh, you all will have in place when an event happens, um, how the organization will operate, who uh, will have which task and be responsible for those. Um, it is critically um, it, important to understand uh, for leadership, if they're, uh, you know, if your leader is called away, um, who's then going to be responsible for making operational calls um, at the time? Staff need to know um, you need to know which, who's, which staff are available uh, to provide uh, functional support. Uh, recognizing that when uh, an extreme heat or cold event happens or any other type of disaster event, uh, your staff are as affected as your residents are. And so 
um, understanding um, who is going to be called upon should uh, folks have to deal with their own family emergencies is, is critically important. Uh, and then as we talked about, developing those partnerships and leaning on partnerships that you develop in a community um, understanding what roles and responsibilities you can uh, have in coordination with your partners is critically important for the continuation of your operations. Uh, you can have a great plan, but if nobody knows the plan or knows what their responsibility uh, responsibilities are, then uh, you know that certainly. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't behoove your organization at all. It's good to know that uh, over half of you all have a plan. Uh, uh, um, I mean, a third of you have a, have a plan, but um, uh, the question we should have asked the follow-up question, how many of you all actually could conduct uh, training exercises um, on that plan or know what, you, what the roles are um, for everyone in your organization. Uh, so it is critically important that you all uh, conduct training and exercises. You, you should partner with your local emergency management office uh, and, and the fire and police departments. They routinely do exercises uh, and you can join with them as a community partner and uh, just be a part of their exercises. They have to do that in compliance with uh, grants that they receive, receive from the Department of Homeland Security. And so you're, you're PHA can plug in to their exercises. Um, during those exercises, you want to make sure that you communicate the roles that each and responsibilities that uh, the folks on your staff will have uh, during the emergency. Uh, you want to practice, uh, practice, practice, practice is important. Uh, so folks understand the challenges with actually operating uh, in, in that emergency situation and then train residents on uh, the emergency response procedures. All of us remember going through fire drills uh, in school, um, uh, something like that for your extreme weather events will, uh, it would be helpful uh, so that you can prepare and residents know what to, what to expect. Um, you want to regularly review and update those policies and procedures. Uh, it, it, it's important to have a, a scheduled time when you would annually take a look uh, in preparation for the heating or cooling, uh, the, the extreme heat or extreme uh, cold uh, season, uh, a time when you're going to uh, review all of the policies and procedures in your plan um, that uh, you have developed to, to deal with those events. And then um, your equipment that you've uh, purchased and supplies, uh, make sure that it works. Um, crank up the generators and, and the uh, snow removal equipment. Uh, make sure that you have adequate batteries for flashlights and other uh, battery powered um, uh, supplies. Uh, that, uh, again, uh, preparation for the event will greatly impact how well you um, recover from, respond to and recover from uh, the event. As um, I mentioned uh, previously, communication is important uh, uh, within your organization and outside of the organization. So uh, with staff, with your residents, um, both uh, your uh, public housing residents and your uh, housing choice voucher residents, um, and the landlords who serve those housing choice voucher residents, it, it, where possible, it's, it's critical that you do communication um, in advance of, a, uh, of an event, have a, a plan for how you will communicate. Um, there are things that you can do uh, that uh, you can uh, develop uh, systems that will allow you to um, send out text messages and alerts um, that not only come from your organization, but also from community partners. People can opt into oftentimes uh, the city or the Office of Emergency Management for the city will have uh, an alert system that will provide critical information during an event, uh, in advance of and during an event. Um, whole meetings uh, uh, with all of the, the folks uh, in your organization, that includes the, the people who uh, mentioned at the, the top of the slide, especially those as you've done your risk assessment, 
who you found to have the, the greatest risk um, during uh, an extreme weather event. You want to um, post flyers in common areas so people could see them and place in, in uh, both the, your residential and administrative facilities. Uh, and, and you can send out information via mail or email. Uh, if you have uh, social media, use your social media uh, to, to, and um, uh, certainly use your residents and uh, um, their word of mouth communication, but also newsletters that you may have with your residents to inform them about uh, how the, what the plan is and, and what they can expect during an extreme weather event. So th some things to uh, keep in mind that you might wanna communicate. Uh, during an extreme heat event, communicate uh, when the heat advisory is uh, expected and update uh, provide updated information as often as you can. Advise residents and staff um, of uh, to to limit the time that they're outside. Again, uh, you know, think about the staff that work outside. Uh, they have to do what they have to do, but they, and, uh, when they aren't doing whatever those tasks are, to limit uh, the time that that, that they are outside. Um, and if it can wait to till sometime after the, the extreme uh, heat event, that would be uh, best. Uh, remind residents and staff to drink lots of water, stay hydrated. Uh, it's one way to stave off uh, a heat stroke. Um, encourage uh, people to conserve electricity um, that's not needed uh, to remain cool. Uh, you focus on just the, the the health and safety issues. And so uh, use the electricity to remain cool, recognizing there's gonna be a huge draw on, on all of the systems. Uh, and remind people not to overload electrical outlets and breakers. Uh, that is a, a similar thing uh, that you would want to express during a winter chill um, event. Um, but uh, some specific things for a winter chill event would be to communicate also about advisories, um, when uh, to expect uh, the event and, and update them regularly. You want there too to encourage your residents to stay indoors, your residents and staff to stay indoors um, uh, as much as possible uh, and uh, to wear warm and layered uh, clothing uh, to, to keep themselves as warm as possible when they need to go outside. Um, encourage people to stay off the roads. Uh, as you know, snow and ice uh, can cause uh, people to get into accidents and uh, you want folks to, to just uh, stay in if they possibly can. Uh, remind your res residents um, to, uh, if they're using space heaters, that they have to be ones approved for, in, in, uh, for use inside. Uh, we don't want anyone to, to get uh, carbon monoxide uh, poisoning or, or cause a fire inside the building. Um, and uh, again, check your smoke and carbon monoxide alarms and I'll add here your, um, your fire extinguishers as well. Now I'll, I'll turn it to Brittany to uh, share with you all some uh, information about hazard mitigation and resilience. Thank you, Fred. So moving into what is hazard mitigation and resilience? Um, so first of all, I think it's really important that when we talk about hazard mitigation and resilience, it, oftentimes it's related to emergency management. We hear FEMA, we hear disaster recovery, but really this is part of the readiness, right? This is something that we can be doing today to potentially address potential impacts in the future. So what is hazard mitigation? It is the effort to reduce loss of life and property by lessening the impact of disasters. And historically, that was something that we just kept by itself, but really it complements well with resilience. And again, that's also part of both HUD, FEMA's, and the President's initiative is to build community resilience. And that's generally defined as the ability to adapt, withstand, or rapidly recover from a disaster or catastrophic event. So why is this important? Well, as we've learned over the years and more frequently as the years have progressed is disasters can happen at any time in any place. The human and financial consequences of these disasters are hard to predict and the number of disasters each year continues to increase. One thing that we're also seeing, especially when we're talking about extreme weather events with heat, um, where we will not usually see that 
uh, extreme heat events trigger federal assistance. And we see it less frequent than other types of disasters on the winter weather side. So it's important to see what we can be doing today to set us up for success to be more resilient for tomorrow. One of the questions that we've already seen come through is what type of funding is out there for these types of things? So first, there's FEMA mitigation grants. Um, two of the grants that are currently here, and these slides will be available later. Also, you can Google FEMA HMGP or FEMA BRIC, and they will quickly get you to those sites. Um, but here's two programs that you are eligible as a PHA to apply for. First with HMGP, the FEMA grant program, it is tied to a disaster. Um, so I think that's really important just to highlight, but it does not mean you have to be impacted by that disaster or it has to be for that specific peril. So say there's a hurricane that provides a HMGP funding for the, the state that you are in, that's okay. You can apply for that HM, you can apply for a project for mitigation funding for say something that is for extreme weather, even if you were not in that declared area. And then there's BRIC, and this type of funding is, a, we have some examples on the slide, but this is actually an annual allocation. However, it is nationally competitive, and PHAs can apply directly. Now, outside of that, there are other funding opportunities that PHAs might, may find worthwhile to review on your existing funding types. Here are some of the examples that we've provided here. Also, uh, the two programs that we just highlighted for FEMA do have a cost share. It's usually 75, 25%. And so maybe these are some of the funds you would use for that non-federal share. Um, or if it's a less expensive project, maybe it's something that you can um, budget for with the current funds that are here. And then just to close out this, these current uh, mitigation and resilience slides, We'll see next that here are some mitigation opportunities you might think of. We heard from uh, Mr. Tombar some opportunities for readiness that might be a little bit more less expensive when it comes to generators, um, but those are also eligible for mitigation opportunities. Specific to extreme heat, maybe you wanna install green or cool roofs, which might be a larger product project that you want to apply for federal funding, similarly with cool pavements, but maybe you can start today by just planting trees and adding vegetation for shades. For, and then for winter weather, something similar, maybe you want to apply for federal funding to insulate walls and attics, but maybe something you can do today that's less costly would be to caulk and weather strip doors and windows. And now I'll turn it back to Fred to discuss response. Thank you, Brittany. So uh, extreme temperatures can cause uh, dis multiple disruptions for your PHA. Um, uh, during an extreme weather event, uh, it, it's recommended that your PHA assess the impacts on business operations, your residents and your staff. Uh, review and adjust the risk assessments conducted uh, during your readiness check. We talked about uh, that earlier. So um, go back to those plans and, and see um, how, uh, what, what uh, adjustments you need to make and then prioritize your resources and actions according to uh, whatever uh, the assessment dictates. Uh, for your business operations assessment, you, you want to see how your staff are doing, check in on your staff, um, both uh, all those who report, have report, reported to work during the event and those who uh, weren't able to make it. Um, it's important that you understand um, your ability to uh, perform essential functions, um, who's there, uh, who can, um, participate and uh, how you go you're going to communicate with them during the event. Uh, you want to uh, follow your health and safety recommendations that are received from uh, public officials. Your local emergency management and city folks will uh, provide regular updates and, and those should be followed by, by both staff and uh, your residents. Uh, you need to mobilize uh, your, your staff and partners to implement 
the cooling and warming and the strategies that we talked about earlier, and then uh, pay particular attention to your staff who who work outdoors. Again, those folks who um, you know take the shower after work rather than before, um, who work in uh, enclosed spaces without air conditioning. Um, that's that's uh, important. Uh, it could get uh, very hot in those places, and um, you want to make sure that they wear protective clothing. Uh, uh, performing the task that they have to task in. Um, uh, you want to uh, make sure that you check on people who are at risk for um, heat illnesses. During the winter chill event, again, people who work outdoors and uh, the folks who are conducting really strenuous work, those people who are shoveling snow, um, uh, that can lead to um, uh, you know, all types of injury, including cardiac arrest. For your business operations, um, you want to assess the impact on your offices and, and all of your facilities. Uh, make sure that you, you, utilities are working, certainly your HVAC systems uh, and uh, your ability to access uh, your data systems uh, and communications, uh, all of your, your phones and, and uh, various communication equipment that uh, you have. want to make sure I uh, understand how and well it's operating. Check on your residents. Uh, uh, health and safety checks are critically important. Um, you wanna know where your residents are and uh, critical to that um, is uh, having, um, during your readiness check, one thing uh, that uh, I didn't mention that uh, I should have, is you wanna make sure that you have a, uh, a backup contact for your, uh, each of your residents and, and uh, on a regular basis, make sure you're updating uh, both your residents' phone numbers and the backup contact phone numbers so that during an event, you can check on your residents to see where they are and make sure that they're, they're cared for. Um, you want uh, to uh, make sure that all of the utilities that the residents are using are properly working. Um, and then uh, look for their needs in terms of supplies. Do they have adequate water in a cold, cooling event? Do they have, um, in a cold weather event, do they have blankets? Um, uh, if, the, if it's a heat event, uh, if, uh, is there ice um, available to them? And then also uh, not mentioned here, but uh, wanna make sure that people adequately have food, especially in a winter weather event extreme winter weather, weather event where they may not be able to get to uh, the stores as easily. Um, uh, be prepared for power outages. So flashlights uh, um, and other uh, things that uh, lanterns that may help with, uh, with providing light. Uh, and then the availability of transportation. Again, you might want to uh, need to relocate people to heating or cooling centers. Uh, in terms of uh, rehousing, um, there are, uh, you, you want to identify those residents who are unable to stay in the, uh, the units if somehow the unit was, was adversely impacted by an extreme weather event and you need to relocate them. Uh, identify where there may be additional units that are uh, habitable for those residents. Um, after the event. So here's some tips, some things to uh, remember to do in an extreme heat uh, event. You wanna find air conditioning um, if possible um, for uh, your residents. Uh, again, avoid any strenuous activities if, if, there is, if it's possible for your staff to uh, put off some outdoor activities, uh, have them to do that. Watch for heat illnesses uh, like heat stroke and, and other uh, types of heat illnesses. Uh, you want to wear lighter clothing, uh, things that will um, uh, wick uh, the, the water off your body and, and uh, certainly um, keep you cooler. Um, check on uh, the, your residents, but uh, have your residents check on their family members and, and neighbors as well. Um, it's important that there be a community-wide approach uh, to these events. Drink plenty of, of fluids. 
Um, and uh, we talked about uh, the problems that could possibly happen with heat stroke and cramps and uh, the, the various types of, of things that uh, can visit upon someone during a heat event. Make sure that folks are looking out uh, for, for people who are experiencing or could be experiencing those events. Um, and uh, never uh, have people leave people who are pets in, in cars during a heat event. For a winter weather event, uh, you stay off the roads. Uh, encourage your, your both your staff and your residents to stay off the roads to the extent possible. Um, you, if you have to use generators because of power outages, uh, make sure that the generators are only outside. Uh, they could cause carbon monoxide uh, poisoning, and you know, if they are inside. Um, uh, Stay indoors as much as possible and dress in layers and with warm clothing. Uh, you want to um, keep in touch with uh, the emergency management uh, uh, folks who are providing alerts and, and the news uh, stations who are providing alerts about uh, the latest information on the winter weather event. And uh, be prepared for power outages. Check your equipment, have your equipment ready, and uh, look for signs of hypothermia and frostbite on, on uh, both staff and, and residents. Uh, and then uh, finally, again, community-wide uh, approach, have uh, encourage people to check on uh, friends and neighbors. Um, just know that in uh, a, the event of a presidentially a declared disaster, um, uh, and this uh, so sometimes happens in extreme uh, cold events for certain, um, there may be uh, waivers that would help your housing authority in recovery from that event. Um, HUD uh, regularly uh, publishes those waivers um, uh, in the Federal Register. You can uh, get them by uh, clicking the link on this slide below. We'll make all the slides available after uh, this training. Uh, and uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, HUD will consider uh, your application uh, for any of those waivers. Uh, now, quickly, uh, turn it back over to Brittany to discuss recovery with you all. Thank you, Fred. So let's start with, again, what is recovery? Well, by the National Disaster Recovery Framework, the NDRF, they define it as those capabilities necessary to assist communities affected by an incident to recover effectively, including but not limited to rebuilding infrastructure systems, providing adequate interim and long-term housing for survivors, restoring health, social and community services, promoting economic development and restoring natural and cultural resources. The NDRF also reviews the core recovery principles. So this is something that I'm, I'm not necessarily going to read through, but these are the things you should be thinking about when it comes to, I think, one is pre-disaster recovery planning that Fred hit on multiple times and is extremely important, thinking about that resilience and, sustainal, and sustainability. And Fred also did a great job hitting on those partnerships and inclusiveness. So in the next slide, this, uh, these are the topics that we're going to go over high level. Again, these are mainly to be informative and provide best practices as we go through disaster recovery topics. There are hyperlinks, so when these slides are available at a later date, you can click on them. You can also um, Google search or web search any of these, uh, a lot of this terminology, and it will provide additional resources for you to be able to touch on. So the first thing we're gonna talk about are the state and federal roles and responsibilities under a major disaster declaration or a presidential disaster declaration. Um, if you are not aware, it is important to be aware of your state emergency management agency and who your point of contact might be there in the event of any type of extreme event or disaster. The governor's office is responsible for requesting a major disaster declaration or presidential disaster declaration. And then your federal agencies that are gonna be supporting the state um, and locals would be FEMA and HUD. The next thing that you should be thinking about immediately after um, a disaster or extreme weather event 
as insurance. So insurance is a PHA's first line of defense and financial resource. As the primary funding source for recovery from a catastrophic event, it is imperative that the PHA has adequate insurance for all properties and administrative facilities. The Consolidated Annual Contributions Contract, or the CAC, requires PHAs to have insurance on all public housing developments. And the CAC form identified here provides the insurance requirements that you must have. HUD, reg oh, HUD reg we're gonna do a little bit more there. HUD regulations at 24 CFR 965 do govern the public housing insurance requirements. And then the one other thing to note here is that PHAs have found themselves underinsured and missing flood insurance due to the changes of the 100-year floodplain, so please make sure that you are in compliance. However, insurance for properties in the 500-year floodplain are not required, however, are recommended. So recovery is a whole community effort, and some of the things we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides is it's not just the state's responsibility or HUD's or FEMA's responsibility. There's public officials, there's lots of internal and external stakeholders. You today can be communicating with, establishing relationships with, and understanding where they fit into any of your plans um, for a successful and more expedient and effective recovery. The reason I think that's really important is that there's three things to remember when it comes to responding to an emergency or disaster. And let's just start with the first one because it's the most important, local primacy. You are, you are there to drive your own recovery or the PHA is there to drive their own recovery. And so it's really important to be thinking about what you can do, you establishing the relationships and you advocating for the PHA. The state is there to support you. Um, and so they usually can coordinate resources. They can, if you communicate your unmet needs, you can have conversations about what you still need, especially if you um, have housing concerns, resource concerns, maybe water concerns, generators. Those are things that sometimes the state can provide you. And then really federally, the federal agencies and partners are there to be resources for the state to support you. So ideally you're working mainly in coordinating with the county, parish or state, and then the fe federal partners are supporting the state to provide that support to you at the local level as you drive your recovery. Uh, Post-extreme weather recovery might include communication and conversations about closing down cooling and warming centers, whether that comes from your state counterparts or whether it's going to be um, from your counties. These are things that you can be going ahead, establishing re relationships with to see where they may be in the event of an event. Or if, if you're already in the response mode, going ahead and finding those conversations to see, okay, where can my residents go? And when will they no longer have those resources like the cooling and warming centers? Um, how are you going to be communicating your operational changes to staff and residents? Having those conversations now will set you up for success in the recovery phase. Coordinating follow-up is necessary for those in, still impacted by the exposure to the extreme temperatures. If it's what we something that we saw experience in Texas is that some some residents um, and PHAs did not have electricity for days to weeks and in some rural areas months. So how are you going to continue to provide that communication as, um, as the residents still need resources? Um, connecting residents with the utility assistance if it's available and review the experience and adjust any plans for future events accordingly. As Fred Hinmon, it's really important to continue your training and exercises and integrating that to the local and state governments. So that way you have a well thought out plan of how you can respond and recover from any type of threat in extreme weather event and ensure that you're making adjustments as resources may change. Moving on to disaster declarations and assistance. So what is that? Starting with a presidential disaster declaration, there are two potential declaration types that you usually see most common. Um, but before we get into that, let's have a conversation of at, with the polling question, has your PHA received any federal assistance because of a major presidential disaster declaration? Yeah. 
I only saw about 40% of people respond last time. So let's see if we can get a higher percentage this time. Okay, so we have some of the, we do have, we have less people, you all. We have one more polling question from me and I really hope we get a higher percent responding. But what we're seeing is some people have experienced or received federal assistance because of a major presidential disaster declaration, but 40% have not and 41% are not sure. So what does that potentially look like? And maybe this information can help you identify if you would have been at eligible for financial assistance or different resources um, and where to look for them. So we already hit on this and in the next slide, we can further clarify the um, types of disaster declarations. So an emergency declaration really just supplements that state, local or tribal territory and providing emergency services. So you as a PHA may not receive any assistance if there's a presidential declaration just for an emergency declaration, because again, federal resources are really there to support the state in emergency. However, after an assessment is performed and it is identified that the uh, the disaster and damages are to, to be such severity that it is beyond the combined capabilities of state and local governments. It is within the authority of the president to declare a major disaster declaration, and that turns on multiple resources potentially for you as a PHA and for your residents. So high level, if you are not aware how the, the disaster declaration process works, it starts with the incident and this is case, either an extreme winter weather event or extreme heat event. We're not really going to see a disaster declaration for an extreme heat. It has become more common to see them for extreme winter weather events. We've seen it the past two years just in Texas alone. Um, similarly, we actually saw it as well as I believe in Vermont and Massachusetts. Um, so after the event, you might see that people are coming out to the local areas, your county or parish emergency management office may be calling and asking you if you've received any damages. If you have not received a call from your local um, emergency management office or your state and you do have damages, this is when you should be ad advocating. You should be calling them and saying, hey, it was bad here. Yes, we had downed power lines. Yes, we did not. We had um, electric outages. Yes, there was lots of ice. Yes, there was wind storms. We lost roofs. Whatever that level of extent of damages are, you should be communicating that and advocating if you're not being asked. Because the county or parish is aggregating that damage to provide to the state. The state is taking that information to, if it is warranted and the and the damages are severe enough and specific for a lot of the declarations for public assistance, the FEMA public assistance program, it is a monetary threshold that they must meet. Then they can warrant requesting a major disaster declaration. Um, so if it is warranted, FEMA will come out, they will do a joint preliminary damage assessment, the governor will submit a request to the president saying it was very bad, here are the numbers, and they will request federal assistance. The one thing we want to hit on again, I know we already spoke about the insurance requirements for a PHA and what is recommended, but insurance also applies to federal assistance. So it is important to have adequate insurance coverage to be your first line of defense for any repair or restore of public housing. It's also best to have all of your insurance policies printed and readily available for all facilities. And after an event, contact your insurance provider after first addressing life safety issues. The reason this is important is because even when it comes to federal assistance, it would be a duplication of benefits if you were eligible for insurance first. So federal assistance only kicks in and only contributes to potentially having a disaster declaration if it is your uninsured losses or costs incurred. So if that disaster or federal assistance is provided and there's a major disaster declaration, here are the types of 
assistance that may be turned on. If you hear there's direct federal assistance in the disaster declaration, that's just to support states' needs. You might hear about FEMA travel trailers. You might hear about water, um, mobilization of helicopters, um, other, other resources that the state requires to support their response at the local level. If you hear that FEMA public assistance was designated for your county or parish, that's a program that you as a PHA are eligible to apply for. FEMA individual assistance is something you can communicate or resources that you can communicate to your residents that they may be eligible for. And then as we discussed, hazard mitigation grant program is really turned on by the disaster. However, it's available, the funds are available at a later date and you can apply for those funds even if you were not impacted by that disaster. So what is FEMA public assistance? Um, because of how many people did respond that they are not sure they received federal assistance, I think this is important to be aware of. Um, and one thing you can go ahead and do is sign up for a grants portal account to be aware of any times that your entity may be eligible or your local, your local jurisdiction being the county or the parish um, are designated in a disaster declaration. It provides assistance to provide resources to address the costs related to eligible uninsured losses. Again, insurance is your first line of defense. You are an eligible applicant. However, there is a cost share associated. The minimum cost share will be federal 75% non-federal 25%, that can be adjusted by the president. Um, COVID-19 was a great example. When all states were declared for COVID, the president did adjust that to 100% cost share, meaning the federal government picked up 100% of the costs incurred. Otherwise, on many presidentially declared disasters, the non-federal share, you would be responsible for 25% of the costs incurred. Public assistance eligibility is really defined by being a result, any costs incurred or damages or services you provided in response to the disaster must be as a result of the major disaster event. So even if you had a severe weather storm and two days later you had a flooding event, you could not claim costs related to the flooding event, just the major, the winter weather storm if that's what was declared. You must be within a designated disaster area. Again, that's usually outlined by county or parish. It must be the legal responsibility of the eligible applicant. So you, the PHA, must be legally responsible for that facility or to perform that emergency work. And the applicant is not under a, the specific funding authority of another federal agency. This is really important because sometimes um, you may use other funding like your capital funds to provide repairs or to use those funds for emergency response type activities. If you pull from your capital funds, then you will not be eligible to be reimbursed by the FEMA Public Assistance Program because you, you've touched two different federal agencies. Um, so that's something we'll talk about in a minute. Specific to extreme weather, again, we're not really going to see this for extreme heat, but for winter weather, it is important to notate that snow, what are snow related eligible activities because FEMA usually does not pay for snow removal. There are limited snow related activities if public assistance is naturally turned on due to a declaration such as clearing snow in the immediate area and the downed power lines. But anything outside of that for snow removal would not naturally be eligible. However, there are times if the winter storm results in a record or near record snowfall that FEMA may authorize snow assistance. However, it is county based record snowfall and they evaluate that with other federal agencies. You cannot assume that you heard on the news it was a record snowfall and these funds will be available. We have highlighted here the public assistance policy guide version four that is the most current applicable policy related to the FEMA Public Assistance Program. Um, for the public assistance categories of work, this is just high level, again, explaining to you these are the types of categories that you may be eligible for reimbursement. I kept mentioning emergency work or emergency services you may provide. 
That's a debris removal, emergency protective measures. What are emergency protective measures? It's really the actions that you're taking to protect you, your residents, and your facilities in response to the disaster. And then the permanent work being what is required to put it back to pre-disaster function, capacity, and design. But just to break it down, we understand that most PHAs really apply for public assistance under the categories A, B, and E. And here we've provided some examples of what that might look like, um, specifically COVID-19. If you were legally responsible for your residence, you might have been able to apply for PPE and other things under health and safety. Um, after a severe wet winter weather event, maybe that in category A you're, you're addressing on your where your facilities are down trees and limbs. Um, so first, let's go ahead and do another poll. Um, before we get into public assistance documentation, Emergency procurement. Do you have emergency procurement policies that apply to extreme weather? So do, does that mean do you currently have procurement policies? Do you have uh, policies or procedures in place of how you would acquire services that you need in an emergency? I'd love to see more than 70 respondents. I love seeing that people have emergency procurement policies and we're gonna get into that because it is key. Um, for those that do not or are not sure, go ahead and look back, have conversations with your leadership or the people that may be involved in any type of procuring of services, um, whether it's snow removal, whether it's on-call repair, whether it's generators, whether it's fuel for your generators. Those are all things that might be helpful to have on the front end. And the reason is public assistance documentation is key for eligibility for all of your costs incurred to include, include your procurement policy. Now, one thing that's very important is to ensure that all of your policies that we're outlining here were in effect at the time of the disaster. So that means if you do not have a payroll or insurance, a payroll policy or procurement policy or contracts that are um, readily available, please go ahead and print those out or identify where they would be because uh, both your insurance and then FEMA will ask for this type of documentation before you're ever eligible for any of that funding that we've talked about under the public assistance program. Um, it's also key to have documentation that support the costs incurred were not from another federal grant source to include capital funds. So being able to provide the invoices and the proofs of payment to show where you pulled this funding from so there is no duplication of benefits. That's very big with any, with any federal agency and with insurance that you're not asking for the funds twice from either insurance, from FEMA, or from HUD. So again, it was helpful to see that some of you do have in procurement policies in place and some of you do not, those that do not, please go ahead and have conversations with the appropriate people within your PHA. Um, there is a procurement handbook for public housing authorities that is available that can assist you with those procurement policies and what's eligible and what's not. Specifically to any goods or services you procure, there are dollar thresholds that are, if you go over that and you call a friend or you just call someone and that you've, you've researched or Google, you may not be eligible for reimbursement or to dr draw on federal funds if you did not properly procure. There's also federal clauses that need to be um, in your contracts with, with these service providers. And so it's very important that you're doing all of that on the front end to set yourself up for a successful recovery. Additionally, uh, there's the environmental review process. This is required for both FEMA and HUD to ensure that federal funds are in compliance with the environmental regulations. And you have the documentation and the processes recorded that you have, you were prudent and went through the process of any reviews that were required 
related to these federal funds. So here we have 24 CFR Part 58 that is you can reference. Um, there's also additional guidance online where you can look at to ensure that you have um, you are aware of any environmental reviews that would be required and you're following the appropriate process both for HUD or for FEMA funding. Next, we're going to get into FEMA's individual assistance program. We're going to stay high level with this because really this is just infor informative for you to be aware of that when you hear a presidential disaster declaration or a major disaster declaration, you're asking the question, is individual assistance available? If it is, um, if the president has determined that it is eligible, and here are the, the high level criteria that's included, then on the next slide, you'll see that the IHP might be something that is turned on. And this, these are all resources that are available to your residents. So again, it's not gonna necessarily help the PHA recover, but it can help your residents recover. The one thing I wanna make sure everyone takes away from this is that if your residents are impacted at all, even prior to a disaster declaration, they can go ahead and register for assistance at disasterassistance.gov or at the FEMA hotline number. However, most people are more successful on the online website. And FEMA starts to track that data, which could even bolster and assist in getting an individual assistance program turned on for a declaration. Additional FEMA resources that are turned on, especially after an individual assistance declaration, might be legal services, disaster case management, which are those wraparound services after an impact, unemployment assistance if applicable, and crisis counseling. So again, this is the reason I'm kind of flipping through this is because it's not necessarily going to assist the PHA, but these I'd love to make sure that you're aware of these terms and, or you hear this information so you can communicate that to your residents, setting them up for a successful recovery. There is other disaster assistance that may be available, and this is maybe going to be helpful for you if there's not a major disaster declaration or presidential declaration. So a great example would be extreme heat where we usually do not see those. Um, there's volunteer agencies in your area doing a lot of these types of things all of the time and are prepared for to support in the event of any type of severe weather event. So whether it's providing emergency food, shelter, clothing, and medical needs, it might be your local food bank. It might be a nonprofit or a, a house of worship or religious organization that's doing this on the day to day. The nationalvoed.org or nvoed.org is a great place to use as a resource to see what types of things are available in your area. But make these connections today, understand that they can be a value add and a great resource to you in a recovery setting and setting you up to set your residents up for success knowing what the resources are available. Fred, can you go ahead and talk about the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program? Uh, yes, uh, sure can, Brittany. Uh, so in some pre presidentially declared disasters, uh, Congress will appropriate funds to HUD uh, through the Community Development Block Grant Program specifically related to the impacts of that disaster. Those funds are intended to be used for any unmet needs after insurance and other federal programs have been exhausted. Uh, uh, the, uh, the CDBG DR funds uh, are meant to supplement and, and fill the gaps that other um, federal funds can't. So one thing uh, that CDBGDR funds can be used for uh, is to help with the match on your public assistance uh, grants. Uh, Brittany mentioned to you all that uh, typically there's a 75, 25% uh, match. Sometimes if the, it's a really catastrophic event, uh, there could be a cost share that uh, goes 90% uh, uh, 10%, but uh, CDBG uh, DR is the only 
uh, CDBG dollars are the only dollars um, in a disaster recovery. CDBG uh, uh, dollars can be used for that federal match. Uh, these funds are prioritized for um, low-income communities and areas that uh, where there's a concentration of low-income families. And so that means that your as a housing authority, serving the people who you serve, uh, there is priority given to uh, your agencies in the development of the, uh, if it's the local government or state, whoever the administering uh, grantee is in, in the development of their plan. It's very important uh, though that you all engage with the grantee to identify the unmet needs that you have from uh, the disaster up to and including uh, the match on uh, your public assistance uh, and uh, e any mitigation grants that you would receive from FEMA. Also, um, in a non-presidentially declared disaster, uh, public housing capital uh, fund dollars uh, may be available. There is a reserve, an annual reserve that is set aside for emergencies and non-presidentially de declared disasters. Uh, recognize though that these funds are scarce um, and are um, for, wholly insufficient to the overall and uh, uh, overwhelming need that there is for non-presidentially declared disasters. Uh, and uh, they available on a first come, uh, first served basis uh, during the fiscal year. And uh, HUD will require from you all an independent cost estimate. Um, and only the funds that are needed to repair um, in excess of any reimbursement that you've gotten from insurance or any other local or state funds will be provided through you, uh, for you uh, through this. Uh, uh, Public Housing Capital Fund Reserve. Um, there is uh, a set aside in uh, of capital fund um, dollars uh, for safety and security that can be used to uh, purchase, repair, and replace um, and install uh, carbon monoxide uh, detectors um, in your uh, in your uh, housing authority. Um, so if you want additional details about uh, how uh, to apply for these funds, there's a checklist available at the link that will, uh, at the bottom of this slide. Now I'll turn it uh, back to uh, Brittany. Thank you, Fred. So we talked about a lot of the grant programs um, that may be available really for from FEMA. We also talked about some of the laws, regulations, policies, as you see 44 CFR 206 is the federal disaster assistance. Um, you can Google that or you can click this hyperlink later to kind of see the different programs and what's written into the code of federal regulations. Um, we also have two CFR 200, which are the federal regulations that govern the cost principles. That's very important for both HUD and for FEMA as far as looking at the types of documentation that's required when you're looking for reimbursement. Um, but if you have any questions, again, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A and we're happy to answer or, um, additional resources or questions you have based on what we've briefed on the recovery programs and resources. Okay, so um, that is a ton of really great information. Um, as mentioned a couple of times, all of this, these slides will be available to you on the HUD exchange and there's a ton of links um, to get you uh, additional information in any of the areas that, that you want. Um, and now we have an opportunity to hear from three different housing authorities who have experienced extreme weather events. Um, we're going to hear an extreme heat case study, we're gonna hear about extreme winter weather, and we'll also hear about um, an extreme winter storm. Um, but first we will talk about um, extreme heat. 
Um, so just a, a quick bit of background about um, the event. Um, the, in June of 2021, um, the, uh, there was a heat wave in the Pacific Northwest. Um, that was the most significant the area had ever experienced. So we're going to be talking to Seattle Housing Authority. Um, and so I have this um, specifically. Some other patterns that led to this heat wave were described um, as a heat dome, which uh, was a large mass of sinking warm, um, warm air that was building over the Rocky Mountains and um, southern Canada for about a week. Um, prior to when the heat wave actually hit. Um, and it had been referenced as potentially the most significant summer heat wave in North America. Um, just because it's so much above what we're used to in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so the temperatures, um, you know, we went, we mentioned earlier on that it really depends when it becomes a heat wave or um, an extreme event based on what you're used to. So uh, in last year, on June 28th, there were three consecutive days of triple digit temperatures um, at the end of which uh, Seattle reached its highest temperature of all time of 108 degrees. So Seattle has 151 years of recorded temperature history and has only had four days prior to last year with 100 degree or greater temperatures. Um, and that's why this was so significant. Um, only about 44% of Seattle area homes have air conditioning. Um, and in low income homes, that percentage is even lower. So I am excited to um, introduce you today to Bobby Coleman from Seattle Housing Authority. He is um, the Administrator for Environmental Stewardship and Sustainability Division. He's going to talk about um, how, how this played out, what it looked like for Seattle Housing Authority residents. So, welcome, Bobby. Thank you, Jody. Um, <clears throat> it's good to be here with you all today. Um, I saw in the comment, try being near Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas at the moment. I imagine it's pretty hot there in July. Um, so I know that when we're talking about extreme heat, uh, you know, Seattle is a pretty unique case and uh, Jody's points about how infrequent this extreme, this extreme heat is for us here. So um, a little bit of background about SHA. Uh, SHA owns uh, and operates uh, more than 8,000 apartments and single family homes at over 350 sites scattered, uh, scattered across the city of Seattle. And we have public housing, senior housing, tax credit, as well as some what we call naturally occurring affordable housing that we own and manage. Um, our properties and communities are a mix of large concrete or masonry multifamily buildings with 100 units or more, um, as well as mid-sized wood frame buildings with 25 to 50 units. And we have a lot of small multifamily and single family homes um, in our scattered sites program. Um, there's also a lot of community types. So I mentioned scattered sites, and we also have master plan communities completed through the HOPE 6 program, where we have hundreds of units concentrated in one area of the city, um, many of which are single family homes, small multifamily buildings. Um, and none of them have air conditioning um, or uh, to, serve, to serve all spaces of the building. Um, and only a handful of them have on-site community spaces with air conditioning. Um, and many of our properties are built in the mid to late 20th century. Um, and those were built under much less stringent building codes than those that we have in Seattle today. And if you didn't know that, Seattle's building and energy codes are some of the most progressive in the United States, um, focused on energy efficiency, weatherization, um, weather tightness, um, so the short story is that when it got hot last summer, and we had another kind of small heat wave uh, this summer so far, our buildings got hot, and they stayed hot um, over the, the course of the heat wave. And so the people living in them and working in them got hot, and they also stayed hot. So a little bit of background. Thank you for that. Um, so so you had a few days to prepare, right, before the extreme heat event last year and then got to try it out again this year, I guess. Um, 
did your PHA have a written plan in place prior to the extreme heat event last year? We didn't. So we do have um, emergency management plans um, that are focused on business continuity after a natural disaster, um, but not for extreme heat. So we have some invested, we have invested some time since last summer um, in identifying a core set of actions that we must take in these extreme heat situations um, and are doubling down on the work we had already planned to do um, in our capital program to incorporate things like air conditioning and other resilience measures um, related to uh, increasing heat waves and uh, smoke, wildfire smoke uh, associated with climate change. But we definitely still have a lot more work to do on this and uh, a lot of staff training to do as well. Um, so without a written plan, um, what actions did you take to get ready for the extreme heat event? Mm -hmm. Um, so SHA, the way I would say SHA approaches everything is um, pretty human centered. Um, and in the extreme heat event, our first priority was to protect the health of the people we serve and our staff working in our, in our properties. Um, some of the things we did uh, for staff who work in the elements are encourage them to adjust their schedule. So if they're able to start earlier in the day um, and leave earlier before the, the sort of hottest part of the day that we did that. Um, we all, everyone's also equipped with reusable water bottles and has access to different uh, filling stations across our, our communities. Um, to kind of prepare the, the properties and the for the folks living in them, we had site staff uh, walk the buildings and ensure any operable windows that didn't present a safety hazard were left open overnight. And that common area heaters with manual controls were turned off. Um, and then where we had them, we deployed fans and put those in hallways to increase air movement and that sort of thing. Um, we also bought a lot of water and um, as well as some box fans. And those were deployed to, in communities at request. So when people asked for you know, some water or they asked for some box fans, we did that. And our community services division also did some um, plan for some activation of common areas in those communities and the parks. Um, and also, uh, you know, Seattle has uh, a cooling center program for hot weather. And we confirmed where those locations were gonna be and make sure we publicize them in our communities, on our websites, social media, and then also in our tenant periodical, which is uh, on the internet. Um, and the last thing we did was pulled together some criteria to identify who in our housing would be vulnerable um, to the hot weather um, to sort of facilitate some outreach to those households directly. Can you tell us a little bit more about what uh, the communication was like with both staff and residents? Sure. Um, so for staff, uh, we, after a heat advisory or warning is initiative, or, uh, initiated, our uh, executive team and human resources send out communications to staff via email and let them know that the weather's coming and what our policies and procedures are around hot weather, um, specifically like whether or not people can leave and if, if they are to leave, when, it, when are they able to leave. Um, and what their options are related to using um, personal leave and that sort of thing on days like that. Um, and we also last year was the first year that we, well, we, this year was the first year that we had activated a system called Code Red, which is a text mes messaging alert system. Um, and have, you know, try, had, has, had some discussions about how we deploy that to communicate with staff directly and let them know what the situation is. Um, for clients, so I mentioned uh, looking at our tenant data and information systems to identify uh, vulnerable households. Um, so we did build in our uh, Power BI uh, system, which is a Microsoft product, and we use it for different types of dashboards and reporting, uh, created a list of um, uh, or a report that creates lists by property of households that are 
either um, elderly or have mobility issues, um, have children in the household. And if we have information about other health conditions, it includes um, folks that might have asthma or other um, breathing conditions like COPD. Um, so sharing that information with a third party, um, which is the city of Seattle's aging and disability services and other community partners, um, as well as uh, office staff. And we did um, door knocking, door to door knock, uh, outreach ahead of the heat wave and then during the heat wave as well to those households, just checking in to make sure they were prepared for the hot weather. Um, if they needed something cold to drink, we provided that. Um, if they needed a box fan, tried to help them get that um, if we weren't able to provide one. Um, so sort of this, lots of different mediums, um, in-person communication, working with a partner to do outreach directly to households through phone calls and door-to-door -door outreach. Um, emails to staff, um, as well as just sort of the, the additional messaging that I mentioned in our um, tenant periodical, The Voice, and our website and social media um, sites. That sounds like a very coordinated communication plan. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, fantastic that you're able to implement the, the code red system. That sounds cool. Yeah. Um, I didn't mean to advance in the middle of your uh, in the middle of your response, but I realized you were already talking about a lot of these different items about, um, I mean, communication really starts beforehand during the readiness phase. And of course, through response and recovery, um, but especially during the response, which you were just um, talking about. Um, were there other actions that uh, that you wanted to share with us about um, what your agency did in response once the heat wave uh, was here. Yeah, I think I just under, there are a couple bullet points there that I'd underline, um, you know, connecting people to cooling centers. So um, SHA has already done, made some investments in our senior housing portfolio to equip the common areas with um, heat pumps that provide heating and cooling um, so that our folks living in our senior program have access to a, a cooling center um, in the building that they live in. Um, for That is not true for most of our public housing high rises and uh, other master plan communities. So for those, the outreach was really focused on getting people to the city sponsored cooling centers. Um, and in addition to notifying folks about where those cooling centers are located, we have our uh, partnership with um, Uber's Community Impact Initiative. And with that program, we're able to give people rides directly to um, those cooling centers from their home in a, in a Uber. That's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, that's really neat. I had never heard about the Uber program before. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, what did Seattle Housing Authority do um, following to recover from the extreme heat event? Yeah, so I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, we've invested some time to debrief and think about lessons learned. Um, so last year, uh, in the late summer, we put together a small group that worked on a checklist of the sort of core actions that we need to take to be ready um, when the uh, extreme weather is start, starting to be predicted. Um, so that group got together and created an extreme heat and wildfire checklist. Um, and that was really based on some research we did, um, both on the reflection exercise as a group, um, as well as some research on other materials that housing agencies on the West Coast had. Um, BC Housing, uh, British Columbia Housing, uh, was a, a, one of the places we went to to really get inspired as well. Um, so we did that debrief, we created the, the checklist item, um, and I mentioned also that we've sort of doubled down on our capital planning work to be looking at how we better plan for climate change and make our communities more resilient um, to extreme weather and smoke events that are pro only projected to uh, become more frequent in the future. And we've expanded that the original plan that we had to get all of our senior housing community rooms equipped with uh, 
air conditioning, we've expanded that to all of our high rises. So while we don't have air conditioning in those high rises yet, we do have a plan um, to, to do that over time in partnership with the city of Seattle. Um, the city, city of Seattle's Office of Housing has a weatherization program that we work pretty closely with um, and get those high rises equipped. Um, in addition to that, in Washington State for the 2020, starting in 2022, um, LIHEAP fund, the, the rules around LIHEAP funds now allows for uh, qualifying households to use those funds to purchase air conditioners. So um, currently, right now, uh, we are doing a pilot um, with Beard Bar Place, which is a community action organization in Seattle uh, that administers the LIHEAP program. Um, and we're doing just a, a pilot to learn what, what's required um, of SAJ to support tenants in getting access to that program and, it's, and installing those um, portable air conditioners in their units. Um, because our lease policy requires that SHA install the air conditioner, um, even if the tenant does buy it. Um, so we are actually have our, our first event today at um, one of our public housing high rises where we are uh, doing that pilot um, and getting folks signed up to um, order their air conditioners. So um, those are the things we're doing as a part of our recovery. Um, I think that it's going to be a continual learning process, though, over time, sort of iterative. Well, thank you so much. This That is a perfect example of how the recovery and mitigation leads right back into readiness and the whole cycle. Um, what a perfect example of that. Um, thank you, Bobby, so much for sharing your story and your experiences with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me and for highlighting our work and stay cool, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we are going to go to the opposite extreme and talk about um, winter weather. I'm going to turn it over to Fred to introduce our next case study. Thank you, Jody. Uh, I want to introduce you all to uh, Tim and Garen. Uh, Tim is the maintenance director at the St. Paul Housing Authority. Uh, welcome, Tim. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about your, your role at St. Paul and uh, some background on the St. Paul Housing Authority? Yes, thank you, Fred, and thank you for having me today. <clears throat> the St. Paul Public Housing Agency uh, owns and manages roughly 4,300 uh, units of low-income public housing throughout the city of St. Paul. Uh, those units are within high rises, townhomes, and single family units uh, that are, as I said, owned and managed by the St. Paul PHA. We also separately uh, administer an HCV program with about 4,500 vouchers as well. Uh, most of our structures are, are single family homes, townhomes, and high rises were constructed in the early 1950s through mid 1970s. Uh, like Bobby had mentioned earlier, a lot of uh, concrete and steel construction, uh, not as well insulated as today's standards. Um, and then since we're talking about winter preparations, our high rise buildings are uh, heated through boiler systems that provide either hot, hot water heating or steam heating uh, through piping. And then our townhome and single family units are typical residential forest air heating systems. Great, thank you. A little bit uh, about uh, St. Paul and why we uh, chose the St. Paul Housing Authority. Uh, St. Paul regularly extreme, ex experiences extreme uh, winter weather and uh, the St. Paul uh, metropolitan area, uh, which includes the Twin City, uh, um, yeah, includes uh, it's in tw twin city areas area has the coldest average temperatures of any metropolitan area in the United States. Uh, uh, winter weather has its include snow, sleet, and freezing rain, and uh, uh, they are generally prepared to deal with and respond to winter storms. Uh, Tim, can you tell us a little bit about how you uh, get yourself ready for winter storms? 
Yeah, we do a number of, of different items. It often seems like either we are dealing with cold weather, snow and ice, or we are preparing for cold weather, snow and ice. A lot of our readiness and preparations uh, are focused on the bullet points that you see in front of you. Uh, one of the main items, of course, is communicating with our residents. Uh, as the colder temperatures begin to arrive, we are preparing flyers that often go out in our rate rent statements that talk about our procedures and our preparedness and also provide information and reminders on how to operate a thermostat to control your heating system and also safety measures around not using a stove uh, as supplemental heating in an apartment. And of course, we remind our residents about their response for procedures, if they should uh, experience no heat in their apartment, what to do, who to contact, and how we will respond. Um, in addition to regular testing of our life safety equipment and operation and testing of our emergency power generators for all of our high rises, we are regularly maintaining and inspecting our heating systems. Of course, that occurs during the winter, but we do a significant amount of work during the off season, both preventative maintenance and inspections of these systems in preparation for colder temperatures. Um, we conduct additional maintenance on boiler systems. We have our contracted mechanical co uh, system contractors and our building automation control contractors do extensive work on these systems. Again, during the off season, they'll do complete teardowns in preparation for state inspections to verify that everything is uh, well prepared for the colder temperatures to come. And while we have cold weather, a uh, significant portion of our uh, calendar year, we do have warm temperatures. Uh, we've already exceeded 100 degrees this year, and we're coming into a yet another stretch of 90s and above for probably eight to 10 days. Uh, our high-rise buildings and many of our townhome units have through wall um, air conditioner sleeves where tenants can uh, purchase their own air conditioners to be installed in those uh, sleeves to provide cooling. And our high-rise community rooms are all air conditioned as cooling centers for those who do not have access to air conditioning for their apartment. Um, those sleeves also need uh, special preparation for colder weather. Uh, they have specific covers uh, that need to be installed properly. Our flyers guide residents on how to install those uh, covers. And we also uh, will assist anyone who needs uh, um, either a check or um, needs assistance installing those properly to prevent cold air drafts. We're always training our staff, both uh, reviewing procedures with uh, long-term staff and training new staff that have uh, joined us around snow removal, how to address a no heat call in an apartment or a unit, uh, what, their, what our expectations are, what our goals around these, and of course, resident health and safety. And that includes making staff assignments around snow removal. We have the uh, equipment, we need to make sure that it works properly and that we have the ice removal supplies in hand, ready to go for when the time comes. Great. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your communication with your residents and staff in advance of an event? Yeah, so when we're uh, aware of alerted to a winter storm event that is uh, coming where temperatures may uh, lower from the single digits to maybe 10 or 15, maybe 20 below zero for a period of time, uh, we will post uh, flyers uh, throughout the building, particularly in the uh, elevators as they get noticed more regularly uh, at apartment doors, just reminding residents again of the information they saw in their flyers, who to contact if they're having an issue perhaps with their individual heating system, and also um, what to do in, a, in an emergency situation as well. 
Um, winter storms are very can be very serious around here, so we need to make sure that our residents are wet, just as well informed as our staff. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, can you tell us about any particularly challenging or unexpected weather event that you had to respond to? Yes, um, so in January of this uh, year, we had an, an extreme event, if you will, uh, where one high rise of our 150 units, where we were modernizing the heating system during the off season, uh, both heating and plumbing systems, uh, that, it, that even new equipment had a uh, failure that dropped the uh, building heating system for several hours within the building. Uh, we responded uh, with uh, following our protocols by bringing staff from all departments, not only maintenance, but resident services departments to aid and assist residents if necessary. And then obviously bring the installing contractor back and in talking with also our service contractors and our backup contractors to be at the ready should we need their assistance to bring the boiler system back online. <clears throat> we also delivered uh, to the site and had at the ready apartment uh, electric heating, temporary or, or portable heating systems to have at the ready. And fortunately, we were able to get the uh, building heating system back online in just a few short hours. Wow. In these cold temperatures, obviously, expediency is extremely important. And that having all the staff met ready and available uh, to assist residents and maintain their health and safety is important. We did not have to distribute uh, uh, apartment heaters in this situation, uh, but we were ready and prepared as practiced. And our contractors were very responsive and were able to remedy the situation. Uh, that's great. Uh, having uh, a plan, uh, being ready and, and having uh, your contracts in place, as Brittany talked about earlier, is, is really important, I uh, can see. Uh, look, clearly you all have great experience at dealing with winter weather events. Uh, there are others on uh, this training who don't. Are there some best, best practices that you can uh, suggest to them from your experience? Yes. Um, so, in, you know, in addition to some of this response information that you see here that we do on a, a regular basis, I think uh, for those of you that don't, you know, face this kind of um, experience on a regular basis, it's extremely important to have open and honest conversations uh, with your staff about preparedness around these particular types of events. Um, Get to know your equipment well, you know, maybe not just allow that information to sit with your HVAC team, your operating, your uh, boiler operators. Uh, disperse that information and knowledge throughout your agency, throughout your maintenance department, or however your, uh, your uh, agency is configured so that you know and understand what your vulnerabilities are, what your systems are capable of, and what types of uh, monitoring, not both electronically through your building automation systems, but what are you, what are you uh, physically looking at on a regular basis uh, to pick up any potential uh, pitfalls or, or um, uh, items that are beginning to happen, leaks, those types of things before they become significant. And as you heard in, earlier in the presentation, working with outside partners, have conversations with those partners in advance so you thoroughly understand what it is that they can truly provide to you in an emergency and so that you know and understand what areas or gaps that you need to fill internally or with other uh, partners, both um, voluntarily or contracted. Great. Well, thank you, Tim, uh, for your time and sharing your experiences. Uh, this certainly will be helpful for others uh, as they prepare for dealing with winter weather events. Um, 
we're going to turn it back to Jody to talk about a place that is uh, less uh, familiar with uh, extreme winter weather events. Thank you, Fred, and thank you, Tim. Um, so yes, now we'll um, talk about uh, if, if you're not normally having to prepare for winter weather, um, as was the case in February of 2021, um, when winter storm Uri um, hit Texas. Uh, it dumped record amounts of snow on Texas, um, impacting every county in the state. Um, it, the situation turned catastrophic because power blackouts impacted almost the whole state for several days in a row. Um, we are excited to have the City of Austin Housing Authority here with us today to talk about their experience. Um, Austin is not accustomed to extreme winter weather. So just as an example, January is their coldest month and has an average daytime high of 62 degrees. So um, preparing for an extreme weather event um, was not uh, necessarily a common, common experience. Um, but the City of Austin Housing Authority responded to this uh, in an awesome way. So Uh, Lisa Garcia. Lisa is the Vice President of Assisted Housing for the Housing Authority for the City of Austin. Um, and she will speak with us and also uh, Michael Rock. Um, um, Lisa, can you share with us um, a little bit more background about uh, this event? Yes, thank you, Jody. And I just wanted to do a time check with you too. What time, how much time do we have? Um, we have about, it looks like eight minutes left. Okay, so I'm gonna go sort of quickly through my part so you have some time to hear from Michael Roth. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Lisa Garcia. I'm from the Housing Authority of the City of Austin. And as Jody said, uh, usually in Austin, Texas, uh, we experience extreme heat. Right now it's about 101 degrees. We've had about 105 all week. So it's usually pretty hot here. Uh, but back in February of 2021, we did have an extreme event with winter storm Uri uh, that hit Austin, Texas. Uh, we had some advanced warning. However, uh, it, it sort of hit a little harder than we thought it would. Uh, but prior to the storm, uh, what we did is we communicated early and consistently uh, with uh, members of the city council, council members, and other external partners to see what was available within the community. Um, I'm gonna let Michael Roth sort of highlight some other things that we did and give him some time here. Um, but when the storm hit, it was extreme. We had no idea it was gonna have uh, massive power outages throughout the city of um, Austin, as well as the state of Texas. Um, and what we did during and throughout the cri crisis is we continually uh, communicated. We met right away with the executive team to sort of come up with a plan immediately of what we were gonna do. And we consistently communicated with residents at our properties, uh, the Housing Choice Voucher participants, as well as HACA employees to provide information about warming centers and other resources that were available. Um, and this was just ongoing. We were on the phone, we were doing uh, video meetings like uh, multiple times throughout the day, ongoing communication. Uh, we also set up a call center to maintain contact with stakeholders and uh, we utilize social media for communicating um, you know, effectively uh, with partners about uh, meal deliveries, any of the city resources, transportation, and any other critical information that was needed. We also uh, met with the media, contacted them, as well as utilized them to communicate information about the prices, focusing on getting any vital information out uh, with regards to resources, both to residents and employees. During the event, um, HACA employees uh, immediately began welfare checks, both with residents of, at our properties, as well as Housing Choice Voucher um, families, those that were especially elderly and disabled. And we were calling them up, letting them know if they were doing okay. Uh, we secured partnerships with um, Good Works Austin and World Central Kitchen to provide more than 18,000 meals and 50 pallets of water to um, residents at our properties and anybody that needed them that you know, is in Housing Choice Voucher families as well. And staff, as soon as the roads were cleared, um, 
which we really, it was about a day or so. We really couldn't get out the first day. Uh, but as soon as it, they were cleared and staff could travel safely, staff went door to door in the snowy conditions, delivered hot meals and water to residents um, throughout the Haka properties. Um, it, ha of course, had ripple effects with broken pipes and flooding, which required immediate responses um, from Haka to mobilize internal and external stakeholders to meet the needs of, um, of the properties. And we focused always though on employees first when we asked the employees to help we made sure that we we made sure that they were doing okay if they had lost power um, that they were able to come stay at Haka headquarters or uh, we had some vacant properties available in our portfolio that we allowed them to stay at as well where they could take showers and prepare meals so we really just as an organization we mobilized together quickly consistently ongoing throughout the storm and really helped um, people to you know, remain safe and to be able to get food and water, which were essential, and also um, to be able to get into warm shelters. I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna turn it over to Michael Roth because he has a lot more information and we don't have a lot of time left here, but to talk about how we uh, did other collaborations um, within this and some best practices as well. So Michael, if you're on, I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you. My role at the Housing Authority here in Austin is the Director of Housing Operations. So I'll say, first of all, that this storm hit perfect in the sense that we were all, because of the pandemic, had adjusted to that work from home uh, platform, which made it, made it a lot easier for us to do all this phone calling and all this resident uh, check-ins and so on that, that Lisa spoke about. But really, there were there was a couple key elements to the collaboration and partnership that were absolutely key to our success. First was the communication with all of our city and community leaders and working with our, our Office of Emergency Management in the city of Austin. You know, that allowed us to be able to get, for example, a, a capital metro bus, our transportation system here in the city of Austin, directly to one of our senior sites to take uh, residents from that property to one of the warming centers. That property was one of our most severely hit and had been without power and uh, electricity and heat for several days. And so being able to transport them to a safe place uh, where they could be warm and have food and care was, was really necessary and important. But a second element of uh, collaboration and partnership that was really, really important was our existing vendors and contractors that we had in place. You know, the, the response to this really had kind of twofold for the infrastructure. We're not built for cold weather in Austin, Texas. Our pipes are not designed to get down below zero and without bursting. So we had to get out to out there to quickly, you know, mitigate the issue of broken pipes that were then freezing and creating other problems inside of our, our residence units. So our relationship with our, our vendors, plumbers, contractors, et cetera, was, was key because they were, they were actually in some cases getting to the property faster than we could get our own staff to the property. Uh, and, but, and they willingly went and, and they, they, they got there and they helped us get through that mitigation process of, of stopping the, the, those water flow and stopping the freezing and the damage that was being caused. Uh, then secondly, after that, we went on to the, the actual repair phase where we had to not only repair all the broken pipes, but all the damage that they caused, all the damage to our flooring, all the damage to our drywall, uh, the, the, the flooring which had asbestos abatement required and, and all the things that went with that, that, that led into ultimately resident relocation and transporting and, and housing residents in other locations while we, we worked through all of this. So the partnerships that we have both with the city and with our vendors were, were absolutely key in us to being able to be successful with navigating this. In the end, with over 18, with 18 properties that were affected, uh, and then the age range of our properties run from you know, being 83 years old, built in 1939, all the way up to most recent building being 40 years old, built in 1982, we had a lot of, of, of different types of damage that we, we, we encountered. And after the storm, you know, as we, we worked through all of this, we realized that there was a lot more to this than just all the infrastructure, it was more than just the pipes, more than the drywall and the flooring. As you mentioned earlier, insurance is your first line of defense. But this wasn't just an insurance like a fire with responding and providing all the data to an insurance company for one, one unit. We had uh, over 125 damaged units at, at 16 different properties. 
So we had to organize quickly with a team of people that were focused just on that, communicating with insurance, gathering photos, gathering receipts, gathering all the documentation of the repairs that were done, communicating that with HUD, communicating that with our state HFA, and with our lenders and investors and partners in all of that. So that team became really essential. That became one of the outgrowths of all of this as well is that's still a permanent ongoing team that works with uh, all of those, those stakeholders. So that's a lot of information kind of thrown at you really quickly, but we, we did learn an awful lot from this that we, we hope to carry forward into the future. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, I apologize for uh, such a condensed period of time to, to share your story, um, but you did an amazing job responding both infrastructure and um, supporting the families. Um, so I realize that we are at time. There's a few questions that are in um, the Q&A. So uh, I'll stay on and answer those questions. Um, and we also, as I mentioned, all of these slides will be available. Um, and we could also email out uh, the Q&A to, um, to people who've registered. So um, if you're able to stay, that's fantastic. Um, if you're not, we understand and, and this information will be available on the HUD exchange. Um, just really quickly mention that uh, we do have upcoming webinars um, and that schedule is available. Um, and then there is also a list of additional resources that um, when you get the slides, then when you have access to the slides, you have these links. Um, so some questions that came up, um, there are a few that were answered. Oh, will the PowerPoint be available? Yes, that will be um, available to you in the probably within the next week or so. What if the funds you use to do repairs come from the capital funds you have allotted to operations? If the funds that you use to do repairs come from capital funds, you will not be eligible to receive reimbursement funding from uh, the FEMA Public Assistance Program. If you use funding from a from other than a federal source, then you might be able to claim reimbursement through FEMA public assistance, um, which would then maximize your resources. Uh, question for Seattle about um, how they paid for their mitigation activities. And Bobby shared that they used a combination of capital funds and rebates incentives provided by the local utility company. Uh, what kind of financial investment did it take to prepare Seattle for what is likely to be a future occurrence? So this is still only loosely defined. For our common area cooling program, uh, they received incentives and rebates from local utility that offset some of the costs. Um, the, for each site, the costs ranged from between 5,000 to 20,000 with the utility covering up to 100% rebate. For PHAs that use the code red, what's the rough cost for that program? Um, and we don't have an answer for that, but we can try to find that information and follow up in, uh, in emailing out. Okay, for extreme heat challenges, PHA building types are challenging to convert to air conditioning and the HUD rules for utility allowance and surcharges make it confusing and difficult to get allowances and operating subsidy for conditioning. So I guess that's more of a um, statement than a question. What requirements does HUD have regarding the cooling such as air conditioning of HUD assisted units and properties? Um, and for that one, I, I don't want to speak out of turn, so I will look that one up and then follow up also um, uh, by emailing out that question. Let's see. So that was all of the questions that I do see in the chat. Um, as I mentioned, we can uh, send those out to people who've registered um, their emails with us and, and send the answers to those out. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we heard some great stories, learned a bunch of information, and um, we hope you can join us for future. So have a great day, everyone.